they felt that uh, she was in somewhat out of control, but still very bankable movie star. And whatever personal problems uh, she had, uh, uh, they felt it was felt could be dealt with. Marilyn's habit of mixing champagne with sleeping pills was well known in Hollywood, and this latest incident rang few warning bells. The first time I actually got to the house, um, she had some champagne and she'd taken a couple of sleeping pills she had, and Dr. Greenson became worried and so she gave me a key to her apartment and I carried it all the time so I could get in, if I had to, quickly. When she moved out to the Helena's in Brentwood, uh, we had a key to the house in uh, a fuchsia plant that was hanging in front of the front door. We know now, we know things that we didn't know then. I mean, that's just deadly. Marilyn had grown dependent on sleeping pills during her rise to fame in Hollywood. She was plagued by insomnia and for the past two years sought almost daily psychological treatment from Dr. Greenson to ease her emotional pain. We knew that she was a manic depressive, which is now called bipolar personality. I think the name manic depressive is better. It's more descriptive. And uh, that always meant that there were emotional problems and that she could have big swings in her moods. Marilyn was impressed with Dr. Greenson's warmth and understanding. Traditional patient-doctor boundaries soon dissolved, and Marilyn became like an extended member of the doctor's family. She would eat at his house. Had a small house in Santa Monica with a pool. She would eat there because he wanted to show Marilyn what a normal family was like. I put the words normal in quotes, but... Uh, so it was really quite simple. And he saw her at his house. He didn't see her at his office. He did everything that was possible, but I mean, he saw the real problems that were Marilyn and tried to keep her functioning. But with just five days to go before cameras would roll on Something's Got to Give, producer Henry Weinstein feared that a solution to Monroe's emotional problems and chemical dependency was eluding even her psychiatrist. Weinstein was left to wonder if Marilyn could ever fully recover from what truly ailed her. Three days after Marilyn's April 10th overdose, she attended a script meeting for Something's Got to Give. Outwardly unfazed by the events just days before, Marilyn focused her attention on the script and tried to establish a working relationship with writer Walter Bernstein. One time I went to her house to talk about a particular scene, and she had some ideas about the scene. And uh, it was a very cordial meeting. You know, she was very, very nice. Uh, except you also got the impression you were in the presence of Caesar. I mean, she would refer to herself sometimes in the third person. About a moment in the scene, she'd say, oh, no, uh, uh, Monroe wouldn't do this. You know, and she was very shrewd about her own image, as she saw it. With the script still incomplete, Hucor postponed principal photography one week to April 23rd. Marilyn promptly left for New York to work on her role with acting coach Lee Strasberg. By now, Marilyn had been studying with Lee and Paula Strasberg for almost seven years. Lee Strasberg was the foremost proponent and teacher of method acting, who challenged Marilyn to become a serious dramatic actress. To go to the actor's studio after being thought of as the glamour girl, empty-headed blonde, to go there, can you imagine what that took? And then to prepare a scene and have to go out there and do it in front of actors, I can't imagine having to do that. Where did that come from? Except you have to see this enormous need to do better. What I'd like to do, that is what I would like to accomplish. I would like to be a good actress. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's not a matter of being on top because I think some of the best actors and actresses perhaps aren't on the top.
Well, it was a big coup for, you know, for Marilyn to be part of the actor's studio that Lee Strasberg ran. And uh, I mean, she was a big, 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 big star and a big, big personality. And for them to be known as their, as her mentors, uh, you know, and uh, uh, was important to them. The Strasbergs opened their home to Marilyn and gave her the comfort and security of a family. We were sharing a room on Fire Island uh, where we had a summer house and I woke up early in the morning and Marilyn was standing nude watching the sun come up and I was looking at her and going, oh. And I said, you know, Marilyn, uh, I'd give anything to be like you. She was horrified and she said, oh, Susie, don't say that. I'd give anything to be like you. People respect you. So I think that what she wanted and what she got from my father was respect. Marilyn longed for respect and credibility. And while in New York, she sought out the company of the most esteemed artists and writers in the world, including famed playwright Arthur Miller, whom she later married. She had a chance of evolving not just as an actress, but as a woman. And I have a lot of respect for that. And the fact that a girl like Marilyn, from her background, was reading Rilke, was reading the poets, was making this effort. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make a drink. Marilyn planned her return to the set of Something's Got to Give, energized by the week-long stay in New York. But a bad cold she caught from Lee Strasberg began weakening her health. On April 19th, Marilyn landed in Los Angeles, suffering from a serious flu. Two days later, she was diagnosed with acute sinusitis. I called her up and I said, Marilyn, what is the problem? She says, well, I'm running temperature. She says, I said, what's your temperature? Just a little above no. I said, I could walk down the street and get that temperature. She said, yes, that's true, but you don't have to be in front of the camera. Marilyn's performance depended a great deal on how she looked. And if she really wasn't looking well and had the effects of a cold, maybe you couldn't shoot her if she did come. Throat and cold problems had resulted in costly delays on almost every one of Marilyn's films. And Weinstein worried the same would happen on Something's Got to Give. She was easily disturbed by the pressure of work, although she worked hard. When she was depressed, her resistance dropped uh, to infection. There's a phrase that is used by doctors called psyche and soma, which means the psychological, emotional thing, and the bodily things. They affect each other. On Sunday, April 22nd, studio doctor Lee Siegel reported that Marilyn was too sick with the flu to work. He suggested that something's got to give be postponed for at least one month. His recommendation was rejected. I'm not sure they believed her. And they didn't bother to check with me. QCOR proceeded as planned, and principal photography was still slated to begin on Monday, April 23rd. That day, 104 crew members reported to Soundstage 14, ready and eager to work. First day was very lively and everybody was happy, you know. Every time you start a picture, you're kind of up because it's something new. Everybody was very excited about the film and very hot, and the film was to start. And of course, uh, the director said, well, I think, said you'll have a couple of weeks where you're not working because we have so much to do with Marilyn and uh, Dean. I said, well, that's fine with me. Call me when you need me. But that first morning, Marilyn failed to show up. The phone rings around 7.30, and they said, could you come to the studio right away? And I said, of course. George Cukor was forced to quickly reorganize his shooting schedule. This scene with Dean Martin and Sid Charisse became the first moment of Something's Got to Give captured on film. All right, Molly, get up and go. Camera! Here Martin's character, Nicholas Arden, returns from his honeymoon with his new bride, Bianca, played by Sid Charisse. Well, here we are. Home sweet home. 
later, Timmy, front and center, Daddy's home. Did you order any carpentry work done, darling? Maybe they're hitting each other over the head. Let's go get them. Cut it, go it. Cut. 80. Hello, my darling. Hi, Daddy. Hi, Daddy. Now, is that all you got to say? No present. No, no present. Look, what are you two doing up there? Building the treehouse. <laughs> Lita, what's the matter with the house? What are you doing up there? Building a tree house. A tree house? You just said that to me. The following day, on April 24th, Monroe called in sick again. She even missed a planned visit to the set by the Shah of Iran and his wife, Empress Farah, who were in the U.S. on a goodwill tour. Ginger Rogers is also on hand to greet the distinguished visitors and ebullient Bob Hope. The upper classes, of course, were all pro-Shah, and I have nothing against the Shah. I even liked Artie Shah, so it shows that I'm neutral on this question. But uh, Hollywood was uh, quite appropriately agog at meeting foreign royalty. Although the dignitaries were anxious to meet Monroe, she refused to appear. And I tried to get her there. I called and said, the Shah's coming, you got to come. And she said, I can't come because he is anti-Israel. And I think she didn't come because she didn't think she'd be pretty enough. You know, we're all waiting for Melon to come around, and they would say, well, we'll just shoot the scene today with you and Steve. Their Majesties then visit a set of Something's Got to Give, to which they are welcomed by Sid Charisse and director George Cukor. Instead of meeting Marilyn, the Shaw and his wife watched this scene where Sid Charisse's character, Bianca, appeals to her psychoanalyst, portrayed by Steve Allen. Cameron! But I happen to know that Nicholas is madly in love with me. I see. That's why it's so maddening, this, this shyness. Yes. Well, now. <clears throat> now, you say that even though... Joe, there you are. For the rest of the week, Monroe was a no-show, and the company worked around her. She definitely had sinusitis that summer. She definitely some, had some bronchial infection occasionally from the drip from the sinus down into her chest. And she felt, at times, felt definitely weak and depleted by the infection. 191. On Monday, April 30th, one whole week after production had begun, Marilyn reported to work for the first time. That day, George Cukor shot several takes where Marilyn's character, Ellen, emote silently, reacting to being at home for the first time in five years. On Tuesday, May 1st, Marilyn was on the set at 7 a.m. against the advice of the studio's own doctor. But after only moments, the actress collapsed and was rushed home. Cukor, he said, now you don't worry about anything. This is all going to be just fine. Marilyn, you know, we have to have patience with Marilyn. This isn't unusual at all. But she's so wonderful that the results will certainly be worth it. Cukor patiently moved ahead with the scene, featuring Dean Martin and Phil Silvers. Here, Nick Arden discovers that his first wife, Ellen, was not stranded alone on that South Seas island. Well, they have a report, actually a rumor, that a woman answering the general description of your first wife was picked up by an American submarine. Well, to tell you the truth, as was a young man answering the general description of Stephen Burkett, who's reported drowned the same time your wife was. Oh, it's absurd. A man was rescued at the same time as my wife? No, no, a, a young man, according to this unverified rumor. They were on this island together for five years? <laughs> Ridiculous, isn't it? 279. Marilyn was absent for the rest of the second week, during which these scenes with Dean Martin, Sid Charisse, and John McIver were shot. Happy when you... 303. Steve. Cameron! Yeah. Wasn't I uh, supposed to marry somebody? Yeah. Us. What? Yes. Already? Well, it's been five years, sir. I mean, they were marvelous. I mean, they were real pros. 
You know, she she was just charming and nice. She would never say anything. She just went along with the flow. She's very quiet, very ladylike. I think she scares half the crew sometimes. She's a perfectionist. She's just great. Dean Martin was just superb. And he'd always have a golf club, always be swinging it, always be swinging it. He called me in, he said, now sit, nothing's going to happen. Just be patient, wait it out. I mean, just the opposite of everybody who was uh, running around trying to do whatever they were doing. He was, he was stalwart. Marilyn may have been out sick, but she did keep her eyes and ears on the set. All right. Camera. I got a call from Marilyn one day. She says, Sid Charisse is patting her breasts. I said, Marilyn, you haven't been on the set. You don't know. Uh, how can she say, I have people watching. I said, well, how can she? She's wearing this negligee. She says, a little negligee. You can't do it. She says, you don't know anything. <laughs> I said, but if you think I'm going to tell Miss Charisse if she's doing to stop doing it, you're mistaken. On Monday, May 7th, Marilyn called in sick for the 10th time. And now her behavior was starting to test even the crew's patience. She seemed healthy. All this talk that she had these colds and things, I never saw any evidence of it. Up to a point, I believed it. You know, I was certainly ready to believe that she was susceptible to colds and, you know, and, and the rest of that. But I didn't get any sense of drinking when she came to work. 